Thematic investing is really the process of looking forward at where we think the world is going and what are the companies that stand to benefit from that future unfolding the way we expect it to. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Stephanie Kelton will be back next week. Imagine it's 2052. What does the world look like? And from renewable energy to robots, what are the technologies and trends that define this future? Now imagine investing in those technologies and trends. If you make the right bets and the future you foresee materializes, you could stand to win and win big. Thematic investing is really the process of looking forward at where we think the world is going and what are the companies that stand to benefit from that future unfolding the way we expect it to. That's Jay Jacobs, the U.S. head of thematics and active equity ETFs at BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager. So over the long run, what we try to look at is long-term structural themes. We call this megatrend investing at BlackRock. We might look at breakthrough technologies. We look at climate change and resource scarcity. We look at urbanization. We look at all of these really powerful trends happening around the world that we believe are going to emerge over the next 5, 10, or even multiple decades and try to anticipate which types of companies and which areas of the economy are going to really thrive because of these long-term structural changes materializing. Broadly speaking, investing thematically isn't a new idea. And in fact, investors have probably been thinking thematically for decades, if not centuries. But contemporary thematic investing, where themes are packaged into consumer-friendly ETFs that may be easily bought and sold, is a relatively new idea. These thematic ETFs enable a range of investors, from individuals to institutions, to hold a curated set of securities that express a belief about the potential of a given theme. What's an ETF, you ask? The letters stand for Exchange Traded Fund, and an ETF is a collection of securities that trade on exchanges. Many ETFs track the S&P 500, for example, and mirror the holdings of a specific index. ETFs, which first appeared in the 1990s, have become very common because they enable investors to easily buy and sell a holistic piece of something as broad as the S&P 500. But thematic ETFs, on the other hand, track a theme, not an index. So how does an asset manager like BlackRock go about identifying a winning theme, which it can organize in an ETF? There's a very robust process where we are constantly thinking about potential new themes, but then we refine those based off of a lot of research to really decide what are the key themes that we're going to bring out into an ETF. So at any given moment, we might have dozens of themes that are on our radar. And this is actually the really fun part. This is where we get to sit around and think about the future with really you know no constraints. We can read what other interesting research is coming out. We can look at consulting companies and see what their research we can look at futurists and see what they're talking about. Really, we're trying to collect as much information as possible about potential themes that are happening around the world. Current BlackRock thematic ETFs include the iShares Robotics and Artificial Intelligence Multi-Sector ETF, try saying that one three times fast, or the iShares Self-Driving EV and Tech ETF, or the iShares Global Clean Energy ETF, to name just a few. And by the way, BlackRock isn't the only shop in town. Far from it. There's Charles Schwab's Crypto Thematic ETF, a ProShares Decline of the Retail Store ETF, and you may have also heard of Kathy Wood's ARK Innovation ETF. BlackRock looks for themes that they think will have a powerful impact on the future of the global economy. So you might look at things like what's the total addressable market for the theme? If it's a technology, what is the state of the technology? What other technologies need to maybe mature for this technology to work? Is there a path to profitability for this theme? Really, we kind of battle test this theme from a conviction perspective to determine, is this a powerful theme that we believe is likely to mature going forward? Put another way, is the theme viable? The second thing we look at is investability. So a lot of themes can be really interesting and really potentially powerful, but can you get good exposure to it? Really pure play exposure 
through publicly traded securities, meaning stocks that trade on a stock exchange. When we do that, we find that a lot of themes that are interesting themes just might not be ready to come out in an ETF because we can't get that refined exposure to it. Meaning, is it possible to create an ETF around the theme or not so much? And then the third thing we look at is time horizon. So we don't just want themes that are going to be over tomorrow. We also don't want themes that are going to be taking off 100 years from now. There's really a sweet spot of themes that we believe are going to be ramping up in the next five years and really playing out ideally over the next 10 to 20. We asked Jacobs if he could talk about a theme that BlackRock had identified but had determined wasn't quite ready for prime time. I would never say I reject a theme. We often put them on pause, meaning we either want to see the conviction case continue to build or the investability build or the time horizon evolve before we believe that the theme is more ready for prime time. So I can't talk too much about our pipeline, but I'll, I'll use kind of a almost fantastical example to, to highlight this for our investors, asteroid mining. Asteroids, uh, there are some asteroids floating around our solar system that have trillions of dollars of, of material on them. It could be diamonds, it could be platinum, it could be gold, but they are literally floating rocks full of some of the most valuable materials in the galaxy, I guess we have to say. And if you think about it from a classic thematic investing sense, you would say that is so much money out there that this is such a big opportunity that purely from a conviction perspective, we have to be chasing this opportunity. We should all be mining asteroids going forward. But when we start to put it through our checklist, we start to see where that falls apart. First of all, is the technology ready? No, we're still trying to get back to the moon 50 years later. Two, is this investable? Are there companies that are really building asteroid mining technology going forward that are pure play exposures to this? No, also. And then how soon is this likely to happen? Are we gonna to start to see an acceleration of this in five years or 10 years or 20 years? Unlikely. This is probably something that is 40, 50 years out at this point. So on one hand, it looks like this could be an incredible futuristic theme that has so much value in it. But when you start to run it through that checklist, you realize it really isn't ready. Asteroid mining might sound pretty far out, pun intended. But imagine traveling back in time to 1990 and explaining the iPhone to an audience full of savvy, empirically minded skeptics you might have been laughed off the stage. Whether you're thinking this sounds incredibly dubious or incredibly fascinating, you might be wondering, who's buying these things? The market for thematic ETFs is really three different groups. The first group is end investors. This could be individuals who are managing money for themselves and logging into a online brokerage account or mobile app and can buy stocks or uh, ETFs and are buying thematic ETFs often because these themes really resonate with them, that these aren't just an obscure financial concept, but something that they're seeing in their everyday lives. They're making the connection between, I see more electric vehicles on the road. I believe we're still early in electric vehicle adoption. I think there's investment opportunity here. And there's a thematic ETF that provides exposure to the entire value chain of electric and autonomous vehicles. The second group is really the wealth space, wealth managers who are managing money on behalf of clients. And then finally, the last group is more on the institutional side. This could be pension funds, this could be insurance companies, this could be other asset managers. I would say relative to other investment styles, the end investor group is more important in this case or, or kind of over-indexed in this space, meaning a, a more frequent buyer. And again, it comes back to that relatability of thematic investing that end investors really intuitively understand matching these ideas with their investments. Matching ideas and investments comes with a cost, and thematic ETFs are more expensive than an ETF that tracks the S&P 500. Many thematic ETFs on our platform are around 47 basis points. That's a cost of $47 a year for every 10,000 invested. Compare that to BlackRock's iShares S&P 500 Index Fund, which costs $1 per year for every 10,000 invested. So part of the reason why thematic ETFs are maybe a little bit more expensive than core products like an S&P 500 index fund is that they're designed to be smaller parts of one's portfolio. So someone might have 
a core part of their portfolio, we call it 80%, 85% of their portfolio could be the S&P 500 or and broad emerging markets and broad international markets and maybe some broad fixed income. But they're supplementing that exposure with 5, 10, 15% of their portfolio in thematic ETFs. And so naturally, because it's kind of a smaller part of a portfolio and these funds tend to be a bit smaller than core products, it means the prices are a little bit higher but when you think about the total fees of that portfolio, they're still very low. As of earlier this year, BlackRock had nearly $10 trillion in assets under management. How much of that $10 trillion is in thematic investing? So in the United States, we have a little over $16 billion in thematic investing. And again, as I said, this is still, uh, this is still newer. This is an emerging field. The thematic ETF space in particular is still very early. But even at $16 billion, this has been one of our fastest growing product segments over the last few years. So it's uh, relatively small in absolute terms, but one of the fastest growing spaces. The appeal of thematic investing is clear. We all see themes, and thematic ETFs provide us with the ability to invest directly in the themes that we've identified. But is it just that easy? What about the returns? Have thematic funds delivered on their promise? That's after the break. Welcome back to the best new ideas in money. Before the break, we heard from Jay Jacobs, who walked us through how BlackRock approaches thematic investing and how the world's largest asset manager identifies durable themes that are suitable for packaging in thematic ETFs. But even though thematic investing and thematic funds are popular today, the concept itself isn't new. According to Brian Armour, director of passive strategies research at Morningstar, the first thematic fund actually appeared in 1948. The theme? Television. So in 1948, Television Shares Management Corporation launched the Television Fund, which sought to profit from the burgeoning television industry when there were only a million television sets in the U.S. and color TV wasn't even around yet. Also in the 50s, we saw a string of uh, future technology-focused thematic funds that debuted, including Atomic Development. Development Mutual Fund and a, a Missiles, Rockets, Jets, and Automation Fund. And then 1960s, there was even a futuristic fund called the Stedman Oceanographic Fund, which invests in companies aiming to farm and build communities underwater. Unlike television, those underwater communities never quite came to be. But aside from the theme itself, there's a forward-looking optimism that thematic investing harnesses. And that's just as evident in more recent history as it was in the space age. These themes can capture investors' imaginations, and more recently, when the dot-com bubble inflated, so did the number of internet and tech-related thematic fund launches. Armour is referring to the dot-com boom and bust of the 1990s. After the bubble burst, most ended up closing. You know, today, just five of those 50 internet-themed funds launched in that period uh, still remain. But what about thematic ETFs as we know them today? The first thematic ETFs that still survive today were launched in the mid-2000s, and they focused on technology themes, clean energy, and, and water. But one of the trends that we tend to see since the dot-com bubble is that we see thematic ETFs really launching during bull markets, especially at the tail end. So there's a burst of thematic ETF launches in 2007 before the global financial crisis sort of put the lid on new launches for several years to come. And then again in late 2010s and, and just exploded in 2021 with 87 new thematic ETFs launched that year. As of July 2022, there's now 250 thematic ETFs by our account that are available to investors. And while thematic ETFs often concentrate on trends in technology, some focus on niches like breakfast, working from home, or even conservative values. Take, for example, the American Conservative Values ETF, which trades as ACTV and enables buyers to, quote, stop investing in the liberal agenda. There's really, there's something for everyone in thematic funds, but the important thing to remember is that none of these funds are, are built 
sort of intending to to beat the market. It's not, not like a star fund manager that is employing his strategy to beat the market. They're all just providing a way for investors to buy a basket of companies that gain exposure to a particular theme. So how does Armour distinguish a strong thematic ETF? That is, a product that provides meaningful exposure to a viable theme. Best way is to look at the composition of the fund, look at the top holdings, look at number of holdings. You can also look at performance, past performance for confirmation of your expectations. So did the fund perform the way that you would expect it to based on the theme? Like if you bought a travel ETF, you would expect it to have dropped in early 2020. And then did it perform really well as the, the economy reopened? And that's how you can sort of verify that the theme is adequately captured by the fund. Which is an important point. Whether you're investing in conservative values, breakfast, or renewable energy, are the securities that compose the fund capturing your theme or not? Meaning, if you're considering a robotics ETF, you'll want to understand how an asset manager interprets robotics and which securities he or she has included in the ETF itself. And that's because a theme can mean different things to different people. Hospitals of the future may depend on robots, but hospitals themselves are not essentially robotics companies. So, what's a thematic ETF success story? One of the success stories, I would say, is um, Dyshare's medical devices ETF, one of the first thematic ETFs. It just gives exposure to like 66 healthcare companies, but it's done really well. It's beat the S&P 500 over its time. So it's one of the long-term winners for thematic ETFs, for sure. It's not underwater cities, but medical devices that win the day. Why? The more boring, the better chance of identifying something that others don't, right? I think a, a big part of this is if you would have bought in electric vehicles or, or AI or robotics decades ago, then it could have been great. But you need to be very far ahead of the curve and, and really just have a, a great imagination, I guess, to see these trends early. Medical devices may not be as exciting as asteroid mining, and medical devices aren't the only investment opportunity that has outperformed the S&P 500. But it points to a valuable truism. Often, but not always, it's the boring stuff that beats the exciting stuff over time. I'm human too. Like we're all we're all very attuned to the fact that like everyone would love to beat the market, and it's hard to watch as other people are hitting home runs while you're just taking your your singles with a broader market diversified portfolio. But if you keep sort of your eyes on the long term, your best chances are always going to be with controlling costs, controlling taxes, having a diversified portfolio that can capture the winners and sort of shed the losers along the way. And the key is, you know, with diversification, you just, you don't expose yourself to unnecessary risks that aren't rewarded. And one of the biggest issues with thematic ETFs is you get into market timing and market timing is one of those things that just, it's almost impossible to do consistently. With that said, Armour believes that there are strong thematic ETFs out there which offer investors ready exposure to themes that have a lot of potential. Like the ETF market overall, there are certainly great areas of the thematic ETF market. And there are also, you know, very poor, poorly constructed areas that investors should absolutely stay away from. And so having like a, an easy way for investors to identify and express themes in their portfolios, um, it could be tough to, to know which stocks are well placed to gain exposure to a trend. So these ETFs do give that option. And especially in terms of like ESG, social issues, major technology trends. There there are good ETFs that work hard to get the right companies in there and do a good job of limiting costs and make sure that they keep the doors open. But, you know, there are also funds that chase the most recent fad and hope to make a buck before the trend dies out. At the end of the day, these funds are built to provide a way for investors to buy companies for a particular theme. From our research, I expect that they'll grow in assets and, and number during the bull markets and especially towards the tail end of bull markets. But there are good durable themes out there that you can invest in over the long term or ESG related investments that you're able to express your views on the environment or social themes in a targeted way. 
Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Brian Armour, Christine Itzelis, and Jay Jacobs. To learn more about thematic investing and thematic ETFs, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch. Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the producers are Katie Ferguson, Meta Lutzhoft, and Michael McDowell. The associate producer for Best Case Studios is Hannah Leibowitz Lockhart. Editing and mixing by Will Stanton. Jeremy Binks is our news editor, and Tim Rostin is the executive editor for MarketWatch. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.